2 Kings chapter 5 is where we're at today. As we continue to look at being a light and looking at the example of Elijah and Elisha, who both were prophets during a very dark time of Israel. And uh, last week we saw, as with the Shunammite woman, uh, a woman who was very good to Elisha, a woman who loved God, uh, somebody that God gave a great gift of a son after so many years. And yet, what happened to that son? He just died. <laughs> he said, my head hurts, and by the time they got him back to the house, he was dead. And sometimes, when that happens, can that rock our faith? Yes, it can. We see it sometimes as unfair what happens to us. If we're doing the right things, if we are going to church, if we are reading His Word, if we're being a good witness, a good testimony, if we're praying all the time, and yet bad things happen, sometimes we can sit there and say, wait a minute, this isn't fair, this isn't right. And yet we have to understand, faith means trusting God when? always in all situations and trusting in him and she did show tremendous amount of faith yes she was angry <laughs> yes she had questions she had doubts but her first step was let's go get elisha let's go get him he can do something because god can do something right and we had the situation with the staff and that didn't work but did elisha give up no elisha then laid on him and prayed to God, and eventually that young boy came back to life. But as we saw last week, even if God in that situation had said what? No. Can God say no? And still be fair? And still be good? And can our faith still be strong in Him no matter what happens? And that's where we need to be, and that's where Elisha was. Elisha was a great man of faith who trusted in Him and did not let unfairness of this world the problems in the world. He didn't let that shake his faith in the one true God and that that God loves him. And that God is there for him. And that God will take care of him. And that God will lead him home someday, right? Do we have that kind of faith when things, bad things happen to good people, as we termed it last week? Well, here's a question. What about when good things happen to bad people? How many know a few bad people? Think about it and you don't have to think long. <laughs> And we have people in our life, and we will look around in our society, we will look around in our world, we'll even look around in our own household sometimes, and we will find people that, hey, these are bad people, right? They continually make bad decisions. They are, in fact, sometimes we will even term them what? They're an enemy. And we can even be very righteous, uh, self-righteous, <laughs> and say, well, it's because they're an enemy of God, therefore they are my enemy. But is that how we should think about things. Is that how we should? What does a man of faith, a woman of faith, how do they look at the quote-unquote enemy? How do they deal with them? And do we have enough faith to deal with them the way God wants us to deal with them? That's the question today. So let's go take a look at this enemy. Let's all go to 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 5 verse 1. And we're going to see this man named Naaman, which I'm going to frequently just call Naaman, because that's just easier. <laughs> Throws a couple of A's in there, but that's okay. Well, so we're going to see Naaman. Naaman is, in this case, the enemy. Why do we say that? Verse 1, now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of of Syria. Now you must understand that at this point, Israel, the nation of Israel, had been at war with who now for many, 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 many years? Syria. And who is the captain of their army? Naaman. So if you're from Israel, and especially if you were one of those cities of Israel that had been taken over by Israel, that had been attacked by Syria, had been uh, taken captive even by Syria, how many of you would agree, we hate Naaman? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he is the enemy, right? He's on the other side. He's a captain of the army that is constantly attacking our people and killing our people and taking them into captivity. 
this is a person I don't like if I'm from Israel. In fact, what does it say? He was a great man with his master, the king, and honorable. Now, wait a minute. (laughs) You can't be an enemy of God's people and an honorable person, can you? Yes. Yes, you can. (laughs) In fact, let's think about it for a minute. How many have ever seen a situation where people who are not Christians, people who in fact say things bad about Christians, about God, who are actually more honorable in the way they go about their business, more honorable in the way they do things than even Christians? Raise your hand if you've ever seen that. Let's be honest. (laughs) Sometimes, now, sometimes it's because, you know, they are getting their way. (laughs) So, but this is a little thing we need to understand. Who calls him honorable? God calls him honorable. And should we give people credit when they do bad things the right way? God does. (laughs) God does. Because when he would take these cities, he would not indiscriminately kill people. He would not do damage without necessity. He would not do it out of hate. He would not do it out of those things. And God considered him an honorable man of war. Now, was he happy with what he was doing? No, but with the way he was doing it. That's why, look what it says. Because of him, the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. Because Naaman was such an honorable way in which he fought, God actually gave him victories and deliverance from other enemies around him. How many think that sounds a little contrary sometimes? Now, let's be honest. It's hard for us to take that, isn't it? Like we saw last week. What was the word we used last week? Unfair. And if you're from Israel and you see good things happening to Syria because their captain is an honorable in the way he does his business, and then you find out from this that God is the one that's giving him victories and giving Syria deliverance, what's your thought about God right now? Unfair. (laughs) How could you be helping the enemy? How could you be doing that? But what does God care about? God cares about our action, doesn't he? Should we care about people's actions? Even if they are not a Christian, should we applaud when they act honorably? Should we give them credit for acting honorably? The answer is what? Yes, God does. (laughs) But is that all God has done in his life? There's the rest of that verse. You guys want to read the rest of the verse? Maybe it'll make you feel a little better. You want to feel a little better? He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. (laughs) Okay. It's not like he got off scot-free. And that's the thing. Just because good things are happening to our quote-unquote enemy, does that mean God doesn't care about what they're doing? Does that mean God doesn't care that they're an enemy? Does that mean God that bad things aren't also happening? What should this tell us? Who should we rely upon, have enough faith in, to deal with people? By the way, he's the the only one with really power to do it anyways, right? (laughs) So you might as well give it to him, right? If he chooses to bless Naaman because he does things in an honorable way, should you just say, that's God's way? I have faith that that is the right way. And if he chooses to punish him by giving him leprosy, what should you also say? If that's the way God wants it, that's the way God wants it. And he deserves it, and I hope he... No, see, don't take that step. Don't go over that line. Let God take care of it. In fact, that's the thing of this whole story. Do we have enough faith to reach out and help our enemy? Do we have enough faith to have compassion on our enemy? Do we have enough faith to actually pray and want good for our enemy? Do we have that kind of faith? I'm looking at your faces, looking at your faces. I'm looking at you at home, too. Don't think I'm not. This is hard, isn't it? Because what is the natural thing to do? Love your friends and hate your enemy. (laughs) That's just natural. But as we've said how many times, 
Should we as Christians do the natural thing? Or has God got better plans for us? He's got better plans. In fact, it starts with the faith of a young woman. Let's all go to verse 2. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 2. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captives out of the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So, who is this girl? This is a girl who was living in a city in Israel, had faith in God, as you will see, knew of Elisha, who was a prophet of God, had great regard for him, great regard for God, yet, what happened to her? The Syrians came and wiped out her city and took her captive. Why do bad things happen to good people? Is that enough to shake her faith? Would that be enough to shake your faith? To say, wait a minute, I'm a child of God, this shouldn't happen to people like me, right? In fact, I'm not going to trust God ever again. That's not what she said. In fact, look what happens in verse 3. And she said unto her mistress, the wife (coughs) of Naaman, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. My prayer is that my master, Naaman, be healed of this leprosy. And if he would just know, go to and talk to the prophet in Samaria, and by the way, who's the prophet in Samaria? Elisha. Then I know that he would recover from his leprosy. How much faith does this girl have? Her faith is in God, isn't it? By the way, we learn from Luke that nobody in Israel was being recovered from leprosy. Nobody in Israel was healed of leprosy. This girl had never heard of somebody being healed of leprosy by Elisha or by Elijah. Yet, what was her faith? In God. God can do it. Doesn't matter what. God can. Wait a minute. Is this the same God who let you get just captive? <laughs> Isn't this the same God who let them overrun your city? Isn't it the same God that gives victories to this man? The answer is yes. Because we trust God when? We have faith in God when? Always. And we have compassion and love for whom? Everybody. Even the captor. Even the one that had caused such damage to her life. She still trusted God and still had compassion on her quote-unquote enemy. So what happened? Verse 4. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus saith the maid that is of the land of Israel. I love the thus and thus, don't you? <laughs> he does not. The Bible so many times repeats itself. I appreciate this writer. Just said thus and thus. <laughs> yada, yada, and on we go, right? Said, hey, go to Israel. There's a prophet there. He can heal you. Verse 5. And the king of Syria said, go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. So this man said, I will go and I will reward this man. I will reward Israel for healing me of this. Did he want to be healed? Did he want his problem solved? And he's going to go. Verse 6, And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to you, the king of Israel, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. (laughs) Now, if you're the king of Israel, what's your first thought? This is my what? Enemy. How many times had the king of Israel gone out against Naaman? Gone out to fight and had lost. Sometimes won, sometimes lost. How many times had he had seen his own cities taken by this man Naaman at the request of the king who's sending him a letter now, right? Does he trust Naaman? Does he trust the king of Israel? Let me ask you something. Does he trust God? Does he have faith in God? And as we are approached, as we see our 
enemies, as we see those who oppose us, as we see people out there and they are in need and they need our help and they need most of all whose help? God's help. When they need God's help, what will our reaction be? I don't trust them. <laughs> I don't trust them. I'm not going to reach out. I'm not going to be nice to them because if I'm nice to them, they're going to come back at me, right? They're going to destroy me. They're going to make my life miserable. I'm not going to help them in any way for all the terrible things they've done for me in the past, all the things they're going to do for me in the future. I refuse to help. Who am I putting in charge there? Me. Who's the judge? God's the judge. Who's the one that decides whether Naaman will be healed or not? God. And can God heal him? Can God change our enemies? Yes. I mean, we just remembered 9-11. Right? Everybody remembers what happened that day. I remember where I was. I remember everything I went through. I remember concern about people we knew in the Pentagon. Uh, I mean, it was a horrible, horrible day. And how easy was it then to hate certain people? Very. But what did every one of those quote-unquote enemies need? God. They needed Jesus Christ. They needed to what? Change. And I talked to so many people at that time as they hated Osama bin Laden. They hated the people who were part of this, the people that planned it, the people that financed it, the countries out there who were hiding these people. Just hated them with a passion. One of them dead. One of them gone. And when I would say, hey, don't you want them saved? Don't you want them to know Jesus Christ as Savior? Let me ask you this right now. How different would this world be right now if Osama bin Laden himself, two months after 9-11, had gone on the air and said, I apologize for everything I have done. I now know Jesus Christ is my Savior. I ask for your forgiveness. And I testify that God is the one true God. Jesus is the only Savior. And I've put my trust in him. How much different would this world be? Could God have done that? Could God have changed his life, his heart? Could God have changed the heart? Can God still today change the heart of those who hate God, to those who oppose his truth? Can God change him? What did the king of Israel think? Verse 7. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive? Did this man thus send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. I can't recover him. I can't, I can't heal him. I can't change him. This is ridiculous. Why would I even try? Why would I even reach out? Why would I even help this person? All they're doing is trying to make me look like a fool. Who is he putting his trust in? Himself, which is a bad place to put your trust. Who should he be putting his trust in? What did that little maiden say? <laughs> if you go to the prophet in Samaria, God will recover you of your leprosy. Who had more faith? The little girl or the king of Israel? The little girl or you? <laughs> Who is God able to change? And I'm not talking just leprosy here. I'm not just talking physical healing. Who can God spiritually heal? Anybody. And we need to go out and not see people as enemies, as people who have done us wrong, people who deserve judgment, because let's face it, who here deserves judgment? Not as people who deserve judgment, but people who need to know the truth, people who need to be changed, people who need to be healed, people who need to come to Jesus Christ. And we need to reach out to them, not reject them. And he saw it as a threat. He thought, saw it as, oh no, if I even try to do this, if I even address this at all, if I even say anything, they're going to come and attack us. Why are we so afraid of the enemy? <laughs> Who's on our side? If God be for us, who can be against us. What are we so worried about? Where was the king's faith? In him, 
in his own army, in his own abilities, instead of in God. But what about Elisha? Where do you think his faith was at? Anyone want to guess? Is he going to panic? Is he going to fear? Is he going to worry? No. He is the most matter-of-fact person <laughs> in the Bible. It is amazing, his response. Verse 8. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, and that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? What are you doing? What? Why, why are you lamenting? Why are you worrying? Why are you panicking? Why are you fearing? What, what are you doing? You look terrible. <laughs> and by the way, Christians look terrible when we fear. We look terrible. We make God look bad <laughs> when we're constantly running around panicking and moping and depressed because things aren't going our way. We look terrible. Instead, what does he say? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Run some to me, and he will know that there is a true God, and that I am his prophet. Who were the Syrians? They had their own gods. How many times do you think Naaman had gone to the Syrian gods? <laughs> How many times do you think he prayed to the Syrian gods? Many, many, many times. He thought it was a lost cause. He needs to know. What does everybody out there need to know? All those people who aren't Christians out there, what does every one of them need to know? There is a one true God. There is a one true Savior, isn't there? And they need to know him. Let him come to me. Let him come to me. Let them come to us. Let them come and see that there is salvation, that there is change in Jesus Christ. So it was like, stop it. <laughs> King, just knock it off. Just send him down to me. We'll take care of it. So that he will what? Know that there is one true God and that I am his prophet. Verse 9. So, Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. I'm sure he was a formidable man. <laughs> Want to guess? With all of his men and all his horses and all the gold and the silver and everything. And he pulls up and he stands at the door. Does any of that impress Elisha? What do you think? No. Again, Elisha is not a man to be impressed by the things of this world. So what does Elisha do? And Elisha sent a messenger unto him. This is the captain of the guard. And Elisha says, basically, you're not worth my time. I will send a messenger. Because <laughs> that's all it takes. What do, you think, what do you think Naaman was looking forward to? What do you think he was going to get? He get? Get some like witch doctor, right? Come on, he had to do some special, do a special ceremony and all with all the garb and everything and do some big, big whoop de doo right? Come on, that's what they expect. That's what they did. That's what the Syrians God wanted, right? Wanted sacrifices and, and prayers and beatings and things like that. That's what they wanted. He was expecting the same thing. Oh, this is going to be great. I will come to this man of God and he will do all these wonderful things and I will be healed. Instead, he gets what? A messenger. A messenger comes to him and says, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again unto thee, and thou shalt be clean. Bye. Close the door. <laughs> Go wash in the Jordan seven times. Bye. You know what we get from this? It is that simple, isn't it? Sometimes the world wants the big to do, right? They want a big ceremony. They want, let me, what have I got to do? What have I got to achieve? What do I, what, and what's the answer? Just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Bye. <laughs> believe in Jesus. Shut the door. Bye. That's, that's, that's all it is, folks. You want to change? You want a life? Hey, you want, you want to be different here? No, Jesus Christ is Savior. It is that simple. And all he had to go is go wash in the Jordan seven times. Now, is the Jordan some special uh, leprosy healing waters? No, not at all. In fact, it was kind of a filthy mess at the time. So, <laughs> so not the best place to be. <clears throat> is there anything special in the Jordan waters or rivers? Or is there anything special in cleansing seven times? If we're sick, uh, we just, should we just go down to the Potomac and wash seven times? No, you will come back sicker. Now, that's a guarantee. And <laughs> your flesh will not be clean. <laughs> but no. Just do this. Just obey. Do the simple thing. Do the simple thing and you will be clean. Now, Naaman reacts in a very different way. But before we go to that, I do have a question here. 
Faithful maiden, faithless king, faithful Elisha. Which one are you? When you see your quote-unquote enemy, when you see those who oppose God, when you see non-Christians, when you see those who oppose your viewpoint, how do you react to them? Do you react with compassion, knowing God can heal them like the maiden? Do you react like the king? I can't help him. <laughs> I'm not even sure he should be helped. This is just a, this is looking for a fight. This is just more conflict. Or are you like Elisha, who's willing to just say, hey, come to me, and I'll tell you the truth, the very simple truth. Here you go. This is how you do it. Now, I will tell you, sometimes the world will react this way, like Naaman did. How did he react to the truth? Verse 11. But Naaman was wroth. He was angry. First of all, he didn't come out to meet me. <laughs> he didn't do anything. There's no ceremony, no, no killing of anything of any kind. What, 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 what kind of ceremony is this? He was angry and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Right? <laughs> I thought he'd do something, slap me in the face, something, put my hand on me, pray over day and night, do something. There's got to be something to it. And you realize how many people out there think the same thing about salvation? It's got to be something big. It's got to be something great. It's got to be a, a special prayer, certain words or something. It's got to be something great, doesn't it? I, gotta be, I have to do something to earn it, don't I? What's the answer? No. <laughs> no. Anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be... Hey, just, just do it. And you will be changed. You will have a new life. A new purpose. Come and be changed. And who's that available to? Anybody. Should we get that message out? Should we have compassion enough to let them know? And reach out to them? In fact, look what he says in verse 12. Are not Abana and Far Far, far Par Rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away in rage. What's well, Jordan? Why do you got to use their water? Why can't I just use my water up there? Isn't it better? And the world will react that way to the truth, won't they? Can't I just do it my way? That's silly. The preaching of the cross to the world is what? Nonsense. Just believe that Jesus died for my sins? What are you, crazy? I have to do something. I have to earn it. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to go on a quest. I've got to, I got to do something, don't I? The answer is what? No. Just believe. Fortunately, while he's going away in a rage, his servants talked to him. Talked him off the ledge, so to speak. And this does show you that he was an honorable man. Let's face it. Most captains of the guard, when they're in rage, who's able to talk to them? Nobody. <laughs> he will not listen, and in fact, you'll probably get your head chopped off, right? But that's not Naaman. And they had enough guts to say, hold on there. Wait a minute. Do you want this healed or not? Verse 13. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? If he told you you had to climb the highest mountain and stand up there and yell to God for help, you would have done that. If he told you to go across the sea, sail to an island far away and find some special plant and eat it, you would have done that. That's the thing with this world. If we give you a list of 50 things you need to do, they'll say, well, I'll do that to earn my salvation. But just believe? Let's have pity on them, folks. That's sad, isn't it? God makes it so easy. You would have done the great thing. How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean? <laughs> Why not do the simple thing? Why not just, the river was right there. Just go down to the Jordan, wash seven times, and do it. And how many think Naaman finally did it? He did. How many, time, how many think he probably complained every time he came out of the water? This is stupid. 
<laughs> can't believe I got to do this. How many is that? That's four. I got to do three more times. What am I doing? This isn't working. This is but let them. But as long as they what, do it. And he did it. Verse fourteen. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Kind of a nice picture there, isn't it? Of a sinner, full of sin. But through the blood of Jesus Christ, they are washed what? Clean. And made new again. He had new skin. <laughs> Completely washed clean of all his leprosy. You think he was happy? And this was the point of God doing this. This is the point of Elisha doing what he did. This is the point of the maiden telling him in the first place. is so that this would happen. Verse 15. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. What did he learn? How many gods are there? One. And he glorified the one and only true God. That's why we do it, folks. That's why we go and be a light. That's why we go and let people know. That's why we are kind to our enemies. That's why we speak with kindness to our enemies. That's why we do good to our enemies. That's why we pray for our enemies. That's why we do this thing so that someday, if they are willing, they could finally, just by simple faith, glorify the one true God. But it takes what? Take some faith, doesn't it? Isn't it easier just to hate back? <laughs> Isn't it easier just to punch back? Isn't it easier just to just to say, I don't care about these people? But is that what we're called to? And if God's people, all they do is hate the enemy, are they ever going to come to God? Very slim. <laughs> Very slim chance. But if we come to them, is there a greater chance? It's not guaranteed, no. But is there a greater chance? And that God is glorified. Now, being a man of the world, there was a second part there. Not only did he glorify God, but he also said, hey, here's some money. <laughs> oh, take all these clothes, take all the money, take the gold and the silver. But is that why we're in this? Should that be why we do what we do? Why should we do what we do? We do it because we want to glorify who? And we want people to know who? God. Not for the money. <clears throat> in fact what happened next verse 16 but he said as the Lord lives before whom I stand I Elisha will receive nothing and Naaman urged him to take it but he refused and Naaman said shall there shall there not then I pray thee be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth for thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. I am I'm not going to worship any other god except the one true God. Can I give you something? Anything? A couple of, couple of mules? <laughs> Can I give you something? Verse 18. In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, I, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. And he said unto him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. I love that part, because he realizes he is going to have to go to the gods of Assyria. He's going to have to go with who? His king. He's going to have to go into the house. He has no option. But when he goes, will he be worshiping the God of, Israel, of Syria? No. I will not be bowing down. I will not do that. I will go in because I've got to. But I will be a testimony to the one true God. That's faith, isn't it? And he came all the way there. But I want you to notice Elisha. Elisha still said what? No, nothing. Give me nothing. Because where is his focus? Where is Elisha's focus? His faith allows him to focus on who? On God and God's purpose and God's giving. In fact, this reminds me of the story of Abraham. Remember when Abraham had to get Lot? Lot was taken by taken captive. 
And Abraham had to get a little army of his own people together and had to go and deliver him and help out the kings of Sodom and kings of Gomorrah. And when they did it, by God's hand, this little army of Abraham <laughs> went and was able to get Lot and all the other people and the bounty and everything. And the, what, does, what do the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah say? Here, take some money. <laughs> take, take it. And what did Abraham say? No, no. Because I do not want anybody in this entire area ever to think I did this for the money. Or that I put my trust in money. Or I got rich or I'm taken care of because of what I did here today. Or because of you, what you have given me. And Elisha has the same thing. We need to have the same thing, by the way. We should not be seeking the things of this world, the power of this world, the fame of this world, the monetary things of this world. The thing, that should not be our goal. And he knew that. Because the reality is, if we start doing it for the things of this world, who do we stop doing it for? Doing it for God. Now, so we have Elisha's focus, but we also have Gehazi. His servant looked at this whole thing and said, you know what? I could use some stuff. <laughs> you know, we did, we did help this guy, right? And he is offering, right? So maybe I could help myself. Look at verse 20. But Gehazi, the servant Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master hath spar, spared Naaman his, this Syrian in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. And I want you to notice something, the way he said that. Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master has spared Naaman this, what, Syrian. How did he still look at him? Naaman is still what? That Syrian. That one who does all those terrible things to us. That enemy of Israel. And he spared him? He spared him of the leprosy, and then he took nothing from him? Took no benefit from him? He should at least have to give something for all the things he has done for us. Shouldn't he have to pay something? But where's his focus? His focus is on the things of the world. The focus is on the enemy. His focus is on doing things the way the world does them, right? Is that right or wrong? It's wrong. In fact, look what he does. He does run after him. Verse 21. So Gehazi followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. That is what we call in modern day vernacular a lie. <laughs> it's actually in old vernacular as well, too, isn't it? Did Elisha send him? Were there two visitors? Did they need something? No. Who's he thinking about himself? And by the way, just a little tip. If you have to lie to get something, you should not have it. <laughs> right? You're doing it wrong. He should have known better. Where's his faith? Faith in self, faith in things of the world, faith in the ways of the world. His faith is not focused on God here, is it? Verse 23, And Naaman said, Be content, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags and two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and they bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house and he let the men go and they departed. Even Naaman's like all over this. He's like, give him the money and carry it for him and get it back. And I mean, he's taking care of Gehazi because he thinks it's for who? Elisha to give to these others. He's being very nice here. And Gehazi's taking advantage. But let me ask you something. Who knew Gehazi did this? Gehazi, Naaman, the two guys, and God. <laughs> Is he going to put this one by Elisha? I, I imagine Gehazi does not have a lot of clothes. First time he has a new clothes. Where'd you get that? <laughs> oh, I ordered it on Amazon. No, no, you didn't. Where'd you, where'd you, where'd you, where'd you, where's all this money coming from? I don't know how you thought he could get away with this. 
I mean, let's look. The little maiden girl knew that Elisha, God could use him to heal. And Gehazi doesn't even think Elisha's God can tell him that he did something wrong. <laughs> He'll find out, won't he? In fact, it does. Verse 25. But he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. Which again is, I didn't go anywhere. <laughs> I was nowhere. Again, lying, not a good idea. And he said unto him, went not, my, went, went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? Is, it really, is this what we're here for? Is this the time to do this? It's a dark world out there. Why are we to be involved in all that darkness? Is this the time to do it? By the way, is now the time to do it? To be looking for those things. Taking those things, seeking those things. Is it really this, that time for us to focus on that? No. So what did Gehazi get for his troubles? The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. And that's the problem, folks. When we go out and we get involved in the things of the world and we seek the things of the world and put our faith in the things of the world, we also end up with the curses of the world, don't we? <laughs> and notice, it wasn't just on him, but his family for how long? Oh, this was going to be a curse on his family. That's sad, isn't it? All because he got his focus off of God. And on to his own self-interests and his own hatred and his own vengeance and his own desires, right? We need to be careful of this and put our faith in who? Faith in God, God alone, right? And we also do need to have compassion. In fact, let's go one more place today. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 lest anybody think this is just some story from a long time ago that has really nothing to do with us. Um, Jesus makes it clear this is something we have to deal with. Deal with it if it's in our heart. We got this problem, we need to deal with this. By faith we need to trust God. By faith we need to do this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Well, of course, that just makes sense, doesn't it? That's the world's way. Why would, I, why would I love somebody who hates me? Well, because it's a better way. Verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. In fact, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Can't be clearer than that, can it? And again, it's not just love, oh, I love them. It's actually do good. It's actually pray for them. Pray for their good. For what purpose? So they would come to who? That they would come to God. Because that's whose desire? God's desire. So that God be glorified. If we hate them like the way I hate us, nothing's going to change. But if we love them, what happens? Verse 45, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes his Son to rise on evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do, even the publicans do the same thing? I mean, the world does that. Who cares? And if you salute your brothers only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be you therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Be holy. Do it the right way. Have enough faith. Faith in God. Faith in His judgment. Faith in His work. Faith in His power. To change people. To love our enemies. Do good to them. Or what if they use it to come back at us? Do you have faith in God? What if Naaman would have just left that place and said, thanks for the cleansing, now I can really attack you guys. Oh, we'll see next week. 
how powerful God is in that situation. Not with Naaman, but Syria. Okay? Can God take care of us? Are we going to trust him enough to do kindness and to help even those who hate us? Yes. Because in the end, has God got our back? And can God change them? To God be the glory.